No, Isaiah. Sorry. I printed it wrong. I printed Jeremiah, but it's not. It's Isaiah. It's in the bulletin, Isaiah. I tell you, I've been running on a low, low sleep here. Isaiah chapter 64. And you find out why you to, to stand with me. We'll begin with verse 1. Isaiah chapter 64. That's what messed up my computer file. We're going to begin with verse 1 and read through verse 9. The prophet writes, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you are angry and we sin. Because you hid yourself, we transgress. We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There's no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, thank you for your word. And even as you inspired your prophet Isaiah so long ago, may you inspire us. May we hear your word afresh and anew in this time of preaching. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me see you. It's been suggested that at the time of the writing of our text, the people of Israel had returned from exile. They'd been in exile, but, but they had returned from exile. But things were still not going well. The temple still lay in ruin. There were divisions, factions, infighting among the people. And there was a renewed opposition from their enemies. It, it was chaos. It was a world turned upside down. One commentator, Paul Hansen, described it as a time when chaos seemed to engulf the earth. And you know, if you didn't know already that I was talking about ancient Israel, just talking about those things, you might think that I'm describing our world. Huh? Don't, don't you look at the news sometimes and, and look at our world and think that it is as if chaos has engulfed this earth? The, the sexual harassment cases that have come out left and right concerning prominent people have been astonishing. It's been a, a, amazing in, in a, in a not-so-good kind of way. It's been shocking. It, it seems that, that our moral compass has been turned upside down. We see it in society. We see it in our schools, in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our entertainment. And we certainly see it in politics. Even in church circles, it seems that many have given themselves so wholeheartedly to a political party that they have blatantly sacrificed their morality on the altar of political expedience. And before anybody gets too mad at me thinking that I'm picking on your politics, let me just let you know, I'm talking about both parties there. It's high time that those who claim the name of Christ on both sides of the political aisle, some of you might be surprised, there are people on both sides of the political aisle that claim the name of Christ. It's high time that those who claim the name of Christ show our loyalty to Christ our King and to the kingdom that he brings and kingdom values, even when that means parting ways with political parties. 
Again, I, I'm astounded and, and embarrassed by some of the words and actions of those who claim to be Christian when it comes to politics these days. And, and there seems to be chaos in our cities. Uh, look at the number of murders just across the river in Louisville. Look at drug use. Look at terrorism. Look at the, the threat now, war with North Korea, those kinds of things. There, there's a song that I used to sing during the Advent season and Christmas season that's, that's called This Little Child. There's a, a, a verse in that song, it's a little dated, but, but it says this. Many years have come and gone, yet this world remains the same. Empires have been built and fallen, only times have made the change. Nation against nation, brother against brother. Men so filled with hatred killing one another. And over half the world is starving as our banner of decency is torn. Debating over disarmament, killing children before they're born. The fools who march to win the right to justify their sin. Every nation that has fallen has fallen from within. We, we could go on and on about our world this morning, but, but like theirs, ours is a world that is turned upside down and it is engulfed by chaos. And, and in the midst of their upside down world, we hear the cry of the prophet in verses 1 and 2. Listen again. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake in your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil. To make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. That's the cry. That's the, the expression of a deep longing. That's the picture of the season of Advent. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. And wouldn't it be great if God would do that? Wouldn't it be great if, if God would make God's name so known to, to our adversaries? If God would so reveal God's self to them so as to make all of them tremble at God's presence? You know, God has done it before. In fact, the prophet talks about it in the previous chapter. It's a story that probably everybody here has heard. It is the defining story of the people of Israel. When God tore open the heavens and came down to deliver the children of Israel from Egyptian slavery and bondage. God came down with great signs and wonders and a powerful hand to lead the people out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. That's the kind of thing that the prophet is longing for. Wouldn't that be great if God would do that again? God came down another time. Only that time it was even more powerful. It was even more amazing. You see, that time God came down in a manger in order to deliver us all from the power of Satan and the bondage of sin. I heard on the news or the radio or someplace this week about certain atheist groups that that are upset about there being too much Christ in Christmas. And I, yeah, I just kind of, mm. what? <laughs> you know? It, it, despite what the world says and does, <laughs> Christmas is all about Christ. <laughs> the word for crying out loud is a, is a contraction of two words, meaning Christ's mass. And, and, and the mass is simply, a, we, we don't use that word so much, but it's simply one of the other words that talks about the service where Holy Communion is served. And celebrated. So you hear many evangelical Christians cry out every year at this time of year about the need to keep Christ in Christmas. Uh, and, and by the way, I think you probably know this, but whenever you see that Xmas, that is not trying to X Christ out of Christmas. It's not even an X. It's a Greek letter. It's a chi, which is the first letter of the first two letters, CH, in Christ. It's kind of a monogram, an initial. It's an abbreviation. For Christmas. So sometimes you'll see different places, maybe in church signs, you'll see an X and what looks like a P, a Kairos, P A D R, Christ, for Christ. So, or an I and an X is Jesus Christ. So that's not what we're talking about here. But you, you hear every year this time, you gotta keep Christ in Christmas. You know what? I agree with that. I agree with it. But I think we need to keep the whole word as well. We need to keep Christ and the Mass part, the celebration of the sacrament of Holy Communion at Christmas. And when we lose either one of those, folks, 
It is a mark that we are being secularized. So powerful is the revelation of God in Christ that the incarnation has forever changed the world, even in the midst of our chaos. And the prophet points out in the midst of a world where, where various gods are worshipped, that no one has ever heard or seen any god besides our God who has done such awesome deeds Amen. for those who wait for the God. Now, I don't know why Isaiah had to tag that last part on there because he was doing really well. Nobody's ever seen a God or heard of a God who does the awesome deeds that our God has done for those who wait. For God. Amen. Mm -hmm. We're not good at waiting, are we? I mean, we're, we're a fast food society, after all. We want instant gratification. And this time of year, the holiday season, we see it clearly displayed. We see it in the stores that now, even before a holiday is over, you can find stuff to buy for the next holiday. Halloween wasn't even over to see Christmas stuff that's being set out. And, and, and let's let's wait and see. I don't know. You get a couple. You get a little bit more of a spread here. But I'm curious to wait and see. You can you can help me to try to find out if they hold off until 2018 before you see any Valentine's stuff. If you see any Valentine's stuff before January, let me know. I'd be interested to see. The stores do it, and they have been successful in influencing our society. I now see lights decorating houses in our neighborhood for about every major holiday, almost as quickly as they put them on the shelves in the stores. And, and here's my annual speech that you've heard before and you will hear next year as well. We in the church don't do much better. We have been so influenced by the secular and impatient world that we don't wait either. You know, Christians for centuries have, their, have had their lives shaped by a Christian way of marking time. We gather on this day, Sunday, rather than on Thursday or Tuesday for corporate reason, for corporate worship, for a reason. This is the Lord's day. This is the day of resurrection. This is the eighth day. This is the day of the new creation. And we gather on this day like those in the New Testament because of that very reason. That's why we gather on Sunday. Many in the church for centuries have fasted to some extent on Fridays because Friday is the day of crucifixion. And the entire year is marked in such a way that we experience every year the redemptive plan of God, not just through the, the preaching, not just through the scripture, not just through our singing, but we experience every year the redemptive plan of God just by the way that we mark time and live out our lives as Christians. We go through two major cycles where we wait long for and confess and repent and then celebrate and rejoice. We do it at Christmas time beginning with the Advent season where we look for and we prepare for the comings of Christ to celebrate His coming in a manger. His coming again to restore all things and His coming to us by the Spirit through the Word and the Sacrament. And then having spent four weeks preparing and seeking God's face we celebrate the dawn of redeeming grace and the birth of our Savior at Christmas. And we continue to celebrate Christmas until Epiphany. And we do it at Easter time, beginning with the Lenten season, where we ask God to search us and to draw us closer and to prepare us as we journey to the cross with Christ. And then on the third day, we rejoice and we celebrate the resurrection of Christ and we do so for 50 days until we celebrate His ascension and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church. I, I can spend a lot of time talking about it, but our faith and our lives are shaped by the very way we mark time. And yet that waiting part, just like our society, is a bit too much for many Christians. We hold Easter egg hunts on a day that we should be remembering the silence of Christ in the tomb. Some churches even before the crucifixion have I mean, Easter egg hunts. 
In fact, some churches skip right over the crucifixion to Easter. And, and likewise, we bypass the, the call to wait upon the Lord during the Advent season. And we jump straight from Thanksgiving to Christmas celebration. And just like the stores, as soon as the day is over, our celebration is over. And we miss out on the 12 days of Christmas. And we miss out on 50 days of Easter. You see, in our lives, we want God to act on our schedule. <laughs> which usually means right now. So we jump ahead and we substitute parties and activities and food and festivities. And there's nothing wrong with the, all of those things. I like all of those things. But we, we substitute parties and activities and food and festivities. But often we miss out on the deep meaning communion with our God who comes to those who wait for him. I don't know if we get this. I really don't. I don't know how to say it except to, to, to repeat it uh, again. We substitute the parties and the activities and the food and the festivals. We substitute that for a deepening communion with our God who actually comes to those who wait and who has shaped the people of God throughout time for centuries. See, earlier in chapter 40, Isaiah teaches us that those who wait for the Lord are the ones who renew their strength. The prophet Hosea tells us in 12.6, Return to your God, hold fast to love and justice, and wait continually for your God. David tells us in Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And elsewhere we read, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. St. James writes in chapter 5, verses 7 to 8, be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Throughout Scripture, we are admonished not to jump ahead in celebration, but we're, we, are, we are admonished to wait for the Lord who actually wants to come to us. How do we wait? Well, we wait pretty much the same way that Isaiah talks about. Verses 5 to 7, they confess their sins. And they confess that they have failed to call on the name of the Lord. How are we? Is there sin in our lives? Do we regularly, daily call on the name of the Lord in prayer? And as we wait upon the Lord, Isaiah calls us to make a full and total commitment to God. He says in verse 8, we are the clay and you are the potter. Amen. Church. That is a complete commitment if I've ever heard one. To say that we're the clay and that God is the potter is to tell God, you are free to shape my entire life however you choose. See, clay doesn't get much choice in that. The clay does not shape itself. God is the one who is the potter. And God is the one who molds us and shapes us. If we are to wait upon the Lord and we really want the Lord to come down, if we really want the Lord, I don't know how to get it across. I really don't. But at Christmas time, the church is not just about having parties and celebrating. We celebrate that he came down, but we are waiting for him to make his presence known. And if we want him to come down and make his presence known, we need to allow the Lord to shape every part of our lives. Yeah. And we can trust God. For Isaiah says, oh Lord, you are our Father. If you were here yesterday for Ron's funeral and you heard me preach from Romans where St. Paul writes about our receiving a spirit of adoption, whereby we are made to be children of our Heavenly Father. In church, we can trust our father. I know in our society there are people whose father's father is not a good word for them. They've had terrible experiences, but with our heavenly father, we can trust. Our father, we can trust to shape us into God's very image as we see in Jesus.
Jesus Christ our Savior. Church, during this Advent season, in the midst of a world of chaos, the prophet guides us as we long for Christ's return and as we journey toward Christmas. Let us be people who spend these next four weeks waiting, not just waiting, but waiting for the coming of the Lord. Let us be in prayer. Let us be in the Word. Let us confess whatever we need to confess. Let us allow the Lord to shape and to mold our very lives. Let us call on the name of the Lord. Let us cry out in deep longing. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.